You're very welcome as we join together for worship on this special day of services as we think of our fishermen's services. And so whether you're here uh, normally every week or whether you're visiting with us, you're very welcome as we join together for worship. And a special welcome to the Reverend Andrew Mullen. Andrew is no stranger um, to these parts. And so, Andrew, uh, thank you for coming. Welcome back uh, to the Kingdom of Morn, as you always called it to me before I got here. Um, so uh, it's great that you're here. We look forward to how the Lord will use you to share with us later in our service. Uh, we'll say a little bit more by way of thanks to different folks who have made this morning possible later in our service. Well, we come to worship and as we do, we, we read these fantastic words from Psalm 89 and verse 9 that say, O Lord Almighty, who is like you? You are mighty, O Lord, and your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule over the surging sea. When its waves mount up, you still them. Well, this morning's a wee bit of a change. I don't simply mean just in here as we look around and we're reminded of all of the, the seafaring artifacts that we have but if you're up early enough, you will have seen a beautiful sunrise, probably the finest that we've had this year so far. And for the first time this year anyway, I heard the birds singing. There's a change. We're heading towards spring because the Lord Almighty is truly good. He is strong and he has put creation in his order. And that's what we recognize today as we affirm that even though the waves mount up, it is he, the Lord Almighty, who stills them. So it is to him that we worship this morning. And as we do, we're going to sing from hymn 22, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Let's stand to sing.
Well, let's continue in worship as we come to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father God, we thank you that we gather into this place this morning, having witnessed such a beautiful morning outside and such a change inside as we see all of the things around us, reminding us of the tradition and the heritage and the culture that we have come into or been brought up in on this stretch of coastline. And as we look back over the years, we thank you for your faithfulness that as we read these words in Psalm 89 and as we sing this hymn that is so familiar, we can look back and give thanks to you for your faithfulness because you are the Lord Almighty. Father, thank you that you've seen each and every one of us through every trouble and stormy time in life. You are the God who has been with us and has never left us. And on this day, we give you thanks for how you have sustained life on the waters Be that as children and young people playing in the harbour, or for those who have gone further out to sea, thank you that you have protected each one along this coastline and in these waterways. Thank you that we truly know you as the God who is over all. And so we echo the words that have called us into worship this morning. We come before you recognising you as our God, who is faithful, who is good, and who is kind. And so we join with your people around the world, giving thanks to you and praising you. As the hymn writer says, let the Amen come from his people again. So Father, we worship you this morning because of who you are. And as we come into this building, we've perhaps come because it's what we do every Sunday, or we're here because it is a more special day. But Father, however we have approached this service, Father, whether we've come with a spring in our step or whether we've had the hardest week that our lives have ever known, thank you that you are the God who draws near. You're the God who calls us to come to you and find rest. So may we know that in these moments that we spend together. And Father, as we do come, we we acknowledge that we worship you and we worship you because of your son, Christ, who is our savior. And so we thank you for such a rich salvation. You have always provided us a way to be restored and return to you. And so we say thank you for Jesus Christ and his wonderful gift of salvation. And knowing that we need it, we take a moment to say sorry for our sins, to seek that forgiveness that as we worship, so it will be acceptable to you because our hearts are right before you. So Father, take away the sin that so easily ensnares and entangles us. You are the only one who can forgive. So hear us as we cry out to you from the depths of our very being that we would know forgiveness of the things that separate us from you. And Father, knowing you to be that faithful God, so by your Spirit move among us. Make us ready to hear your word and to live your word. We thank you for Andrew and the preparation that he has put into what he will share later from your word and ask that you will use him to bless each and every one of us. So by your spirit, lead us in your ways everlasting as we continue to look to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to turn to our scripture reading for this morning, and it's in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 22 to, 20, or 22 to 33, and Ingrid Perry is going to come and read that for us. Uh, Ingrid and Leslie are here from the Fisherman's Mission. And we'll be praying for the mission a little bit later in our service. But for now, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14. Thank you, Ingrid. So, beginning at verse 22. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent the multitude away, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. 
So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Ingrid. Well, at services like these, it's always lovely to have our choir sing for us. And so they're going to sing the first of their two anthems for this morning. And that piece is entitled, The Everlasting Love. Thank you to the choir and we'll hear from them in just a few moments again. 
Well, girls and boys, if you want to make your way uh, up to the front, Andrew's going to come and share with you this morning before you go out to Children's Church. Thank you. Keep coming. Great to see you all. Take a pew. Take a seat. Great. Is there more coming? Come on, sit with me. Don't worry about your mum. See her later. Come and sit with me. Come and sit here. How many more are coming? Great. Well, let's see. Let's see how many fish we've caught this morning. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and I'm number. Right, let's do this again, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 16, 17. Well, it's great to see everybody this morning. Where's 18 at? Oh, well done. You've x ray eyes. And here, this is brilliant. So, so I'm, going, I'm giving up counting. Like, Come on in, right, everybody come this way. Everybody shovel up this way a wee bit. Come on, come on, there's too many of you. Great problem to have. Keep coming. You know what we could do? You know what we could all do for next Sunday? Why don't we all invite a friend to come to church with us? And then Mr. McCullough will have real problems. Right, come on ahead. Come on, keep coming. You have a friend, great. Keep coming. You have a friend. We'll bring another one. Keep coming. Come on, I want to see you all. Boys, you move forward here. Well, bring her. Come on. Everybody move up this way. Right, I'm going to show you something this morning. I'm going to show you something this morning. I need everybody looking at me. Right? I'm going to show you. Is everybody, everybody with me? Keep coming. I have to see you all. I'm going to show you three things this morning. And they're in these bags. Yeah, it's exciting. But, but, the three things that I'm going to show you are not just... No, they're not real people, and they're not, and they're not silly things. Now, I need you to be thinking this morning. You can't be, your mind can't wander. You have to be really thinking. We don't come to church to, to mess around. We come to think about one person in particular. Now, if you want to, give an, if you want to put up an, an answer, put up your hand. Now, now, the man that we're going to think about, his name begins with J. Now, put up the hands, and it ends in S. This girl here. Who are we thinking about in church? Name begins with J, J, and ends in S. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. And see this book, the Bible, tells us all about Jesus. Now, there are three things that I'm going to tell you about Jesus. Three really important things. And I need three volunteers, but I only pick people who put their hand up. Three volunteers. Okay. I'm going to pick this girl here. Come on, you stand up with me. What's your name? Isla, great. Isla, we're going to put on this hat and it's going to tell us something about Jesus. Now look at this hat. I didn't hear that. I didn't hear that. Let's put this hat on. Is that okay, Isla? Bit heavy. Now, does anybody else know what this hat is for? Anybody else? Hands up. A girl at the back. Who would wear a hat like this? Who would wear, I, know. I know you know. <laughs> this girl here, who would pick wear a hat like this? Anybody? Okay, boys, tell us. It would be a, a, lifeboat, hat. a lifeboat hat. And the man in the lifeboat, who else? A fireman. A, f- a fireman? See the way it says Royal National Lifeboat Institute? This is telling us if you were at sea and you got into difficulty, you would want a man or a woman to come along wearing this hat because you would know the lifeboat's here. And what do the lifeboat do? I mean, will they, now, that's the sound they make. And <laughs> do they even make an Enoch sound at the sea? I'm not sure they do. The lifeboat man's coming to do what? He's coming to save people. What does Jesus want to do? He wants to save us. He wants to rescue us. Here's the second hat. Now, I need you all thinking here. 
Okay? Okay, is everybody ready? I'm going to show you a hat, and you have to tell me who'd wear a hat like this. Now, you have to put up your hand, or it'll be total chaos. Who wants to wear this hat? This girl here. Come on ahead. What's your name? Naomi. Na what is it? Naomi. Naomi. Lovely name, Naomi. Here we go. Now, who would wear a hat like this? Can I, let me on this side. They can't see you, Naomi. Let's jump up in these, this chair a minute. What about that for a hat? Who would wear a hat like this? This boy here. A sailor would wear a hat like this. Any other guesses? Uh, a boat. Uh, somebody in a boat, Isla? A captain. a captain. Well, that's what I'm thinking about. Now, this is like a captain's hat. It's really like a captain's hat because Jesus, there's a few things we have to know about Jesus. Now, we're all really good at understanding Jesus came to save us. We've all got that. Everybody's got that. Jesus came to save people. But Jesus just didn't come to save Jesus came to be the captain. You know, Jesus says, I've come to save you, and I'm the captain of the ship now. You can be the first mate, but I'm the captain. Jesus says, you have to listen to me. Jesus says, I love you so much, I want you to listen to me. Jesus says, I want you to, to love me so much that you want me to control your life. See, many people say, look, Jesus has saved me, but you can't split Jesus into two. There's only one Jesus, and he came to save and he came to rule. He came to be the captain. So this is the saving hat. And this is the captain's hat. And there's a final cap. A last one. Now I'm going to ask a boy to come up for this. Because a girl will not want to wear it. Now let's see. What boy's sitting really well with just his hand up? This man here. Come on you ahead. What's your name? Joshua. Joshua. Just you watch. Don't stand them girls now. <laughs> right, Joshua. Let's get this hat. Now I need you to be looking really carefully. Because I don't think you'll have come across a hat like this before. You maybe saw the lifeboat hat. You maybe saw the captain's hat. But I don't think you'll have seen this hat before. Are you ready? Are you sitting? Are everybody sitting? Are you ready? Older people, I don't know if you'll have saw this hat. You really want to see it? Yeah. You know what it is? Yeah. Right, well, you just save that answer for one wee minute. I want to show the old people this hat. It's a lovely color inside, beautiful odor off it. Do you want to wear this hat? <laughs> well, let's get you up in this seat here. Well, what do you think of this hat? Now, if you know, just put up your hand. Who would wear a hat like this? I'm going to tell you what this hat is called, or it was told me. It's called a sou'wester. A sou'wester. Go home and say sou'wester. I saw a sou'wester. And this hat is kind of like a waxy, oily material. It's got a, a funny wee bit at the back on it. Who would wear a hat like this? A fisherman. A fisherman. A fisherman wears a hat like this. And the whole point of this hat is the fisherman has it on. Then when the wind's coming and the rain's coming, it goes off the back and the fisherman doesn't get wet. I mean, smell this hat. Smell it. D does it smell nice? Yeah. No, it doesn't. Believe me. It doesn't smell nice. You can sit down. Thanks, Joshua. But look, here's the three things I want to tell you about Jesus. Jesus came to save. He comes to rescue us. Jesus comes as a captain. He comes to rule us. But Jesus says, I have also come to send you out as fishermen. Jesus says, you're going to put on the fisherman's hat because you're working for me now. And one of the jobs that I want you to do is to be a fisher of men and women. A fisherman goes out and catches fish. But a Christian, a Christian is saying, I want to serve Jesus. So what he asked me to do, I'm going to do it. I'm going to tell people about him. I'm going to invite my friends to GB. I want to say to our friend, come on to church with me. You see, we want to know about Jesus this morning and who he is. He's a savior. He's a captain. And he sends us out as fishermen. You've listened really well. Let's close our eyes. Let's talk to God. There, we're going to sing your song. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the boys and girls here in Analong, for the over 20 at the front, for all those who are connected with this church, for every home represented. And Father, we're praying that these children will grow up, not just knowing things about Jesus, not just knowing that he existed and he was told us about in the Bible, but they'll know Jesus as their savior, as their captain, and as their, the one that sends them out as fishermen and women. So, Father, we thank you for Jesus. We pray that these children will know them. And we pray it in his name. Amen.
Great. Let's stand and sing now. We're going to sing your song, which is He Made the Stars to Shine. Boys, you can make your way out to Children's Church now and we'll see you a little bit later. In just a moment, Andrew's going to come and take us through God's Word. Um, I've known Andrew for over 20 years, um, and I'm going to say this now. I know I don't look it, do I? Um, <laughs> Andrew might. <laughs> it's all right, I can get away with it right now, but yeah, he's coming later. Um, but I'm going to warn you now, um, if you know anything about Andrew, unfortunately, the clock is not for you today because half of it is covered, and it's the wrong half. So, Andrew, I'm warning you now, you can't see from 12 to 6. Good. (laughs) Um, But before Andrew does come, uh, we're going to hear from the choir again, and they're going to sing for us this time the piece, I Have a Peace.
Well, thank you to uh, Wilma and the choir. Can I just say it's great to be back with you again in Analog. It's great to be back in this part of the world again. And it's wonderful to be at this service. For all those who've put so much work into this service, just like Dave, I, I really want to thank you for that. For those uh, in the choir, Wilma, the musicians, for all the work you've put into this service, it's very much appreciated. For those who have so uh, tastefully decorated the church, it's fantastic. You get a bit of a f- sinking feeling. Um, But it's really well done and just adds to our service. And thank you all for coming. Whether you be a regular or a visitor, we're delighted that you're here this morning as we come to worship God. If you have your Bible, can I encourage you to open it up to Matthew 14. And we want to think about these verses uh, that were read to us. Matthew 14, 22 to 33, really well known. I wonder if you've ever been at sea. For some of you, the answer is yes. Maybe you're connected with the fishing industry or a fisherman. I've only been to sea on one occasion, and it was a really memorable occasion. Working down in Moore and talking to some of the local fishermen, I said, look, if there's ever a boat going out that's only going out for a night, or maybe even just for a day, let me know. I'd love to go in the fishing boat. So I got a call, and I always think of Anna Long in this story. So I got a call about 8 o'clock. The Havila is going out tonight. It's going out from Port of and I'm going on it. Do you want to come? I said, sure. I'll go on it. So that was okay. Made my way up to a local fisherman. Made my way up to Port of Ferry. Got on the Havila. Um, they were out fishing for heron that night. I can't remember how many ton of heron they caught. But I got to see them catching it and you know, shooting the nets and all that was going on in the boat. I was really careful not to eat anything the entire night. Um, but that was okay. The next morning, there was a minister's meeting. And the minister's meeting was at Mr. Well, Mr. McCullough's, Mr. Finley's man's there and on along at 9.45. So I said to the man who was uh, uh, taking me back to Kilkeely, he said, look, just leave me off back at the manse. Just, uh, just leave me off back at the manse. Mr. Bingham will give me a lift back to Kilkeely from there. So I was okay. Went in the minister's meeting. You know, Mr. Bingham's there, Mr. Finley's there. They're all sitting around. And I walk in <laughs> straight off the boat. And just sitting there, and I didn't contribute very much to that meeting, but I just remember the whole time the room was going up <laughs> and down and side to side. And I got into the car afterwards, and I said to Mr. Pingham, that was a really memorable meeting for me. The whole room was, me- was moving. And he said to me, that was a really memorable meeting for us as well, the smell of you. Um, <laughs> so any experience at sea, you're never going to forget. And this morning, we're thinking about an experience at sea that you should never forget. I mean, why are all these stories in the Bible? Do you think these are just incidences or coincidences that happen? Do you think these are just events that happen and, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John write them down is really interesting? There's more going on here. These are not just events that happened at sea that make a really good story. It's not just that Jesus and the disciples keep bumping into storms. There's a lot happening here. And we're to get a lot from it. It applies to us. And I'm going to try and break this passage into three. The three questions. Why are the disciples in this storm? What does Jesus want to show them? And how does Jesus want the disciples to respond? There are the three questions. Why are the disciples in this storm? What does Jesus want to show them? And how does Jesus want the disciples to respond? Well, the first thing is it's a storm. Verse 24, but by this time, they were a long way from land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. They're out at sea. It's the middle of the night. It's pitch black. The waves are rolling. The wind's howling. And you can just taste the water in your face. And these men are out in a 30-foot boat. There is a sail, but it's taken down at this point. There are oars. The wind's blowing against them. They were only supposed to be going on like a six-mile journey across the sea. It would have taken about an hour. This is now the ninth hour at least of their, of their, of their time at sea. And they're struggling. I want you to feel it. This is just not a wee story. These men are not just physically exhausted. They're trying to keep their boat pointed into the waves. If their boat turns side onto the waves, they're going to capsize. There's no RNLI coming for them. There's nobody coming to rescue them. There's nobody going to find them. They're going to drown here. So physically, they're exhausted. Emotionally, they probably think we're going to die. 
These are experienced fishermen here. Mark, when he tells us this story, the word that he uses is the word painfully. Their progress was painful. And the word that's used there, painful, is the same word that's used for a woman in childbirth. This was a terrible storm. These are terrible events. And these men think that they're going to lose their lives. It's the fourth watch of the night. We see that verse 25, and that they're, they're the wit's end. In fact, whenever Jesus comes walking in the water, they think it's a ghost. They think they're going to die. The tradition, or we would say the, the fishermen's tales, were that those who were lost at sea, their bodies remained at sea, and then their ghost came and, as it were, haunted or spoke to the people who were, who were just about to die at sea. And so whenever these men see Jesus coming, they think it's a ghost. They think this is somebody who's been lost at sea coming to take them because they're about to be lost at sea. And this is a story here. And it's not just an incident. It's not just a coincidence. We're supposed to get stuff from this. There's two things I want you to, to think about. These disciples are in turmoil. This is chaos. And we're supposed to read this and then we're supposed to think about our own lives. You're supposed to think about your life. You're supposed to think about all the things that go on in your life and all that you face and all that your family faces and the chaos of it and how you can't figure it out and how things just happen and you have no control over them. And maybe that's the thing that we can relate to most of all. The most difficult experiences of your life are those that you cannot control. The biggest frustration that you feel is, I want to do something and I can't. The pressure that you feel at work is because you know there's something you want to do, but you can't do it, and that causes stress. I just moved back from Glasgow on, on Friday there. And I was talking to the people who took me over to Glasgow four years ago. And I was asking about the two men that moved all my stuff from the port up to Glasgow. And I was asking about them. And they said to me, ah, one of those men, those men is no longer with us. I said, what do you mean he's no longer with us? He said he died during COVID. He's only in his 50s. Took a, took a brain hemorrhage on the Thursday and was dead on the Saturday. When I came back home, I was talking to my mum. And she says she was out with friends from Bally Money. And then she was telling me about one of their daughters. Only 34 years of age, she got breast cancer. Just two wee children. And you just think to yourself, there's life. Life just happens and you can't control it. There's this chaos and there's this turmoil. And you're supposed to read that. You're supposed to read that in this passage. And maybe you can relate to that. Do you ever feel exhausted? Discouraged? As if you're going into a headwind and you're trying and you're trying and you're trying, but you're not making any progress. And then there's more here. I never really noticed this before, but... Whenever Mark tells us about Jesus being at sea, Mark describes the storm as a seismos. That's the Greek word. And that has spiritual implications. This storm at sea is almost a satanic storm. There's evil forces at work here. And here we come to another storm in Matthew 14, and there's more forces at work trying to destroy the disciples and set everyone off course. So this is the storm, and here's our first of our three questions. Why are the disciples in the middle of this storm? If you're a fisherman related to the fishing industry, you know that the thing that you do is watch the weather. My dad's a farmer. He's left the farm 50 years, and he still watches the weather. Every night I hear when I'm going out in the car, there'll be frost tonight. In the middle of summer, there'll be frost tonight. He's always watching the weather. And if you're a fisherman, you're watching the weather. You're not going to go out if there's bad weather coming. If there's white water, you're just going to stay in. And do you think these fishermen were stupid? Do you think they didn't know about the sea? Do you think they couldn't read the signs? No, these were able fishermen, some of them. They were experienced. Had they just miscalculated? How did they end up in a storm? Now, you need to look at the Bible here because it's a surprising answer. How did they end up in a storm? Jesus put them in it. Verse 22, it says, He made the disciples get into the boat. Jesus is with the disciples. It's just after the feeding of the 5,000. And Jesus tells the disciples, get into the boat and go to the other side. And the word here that's used for made, it's as if the disciples resisted. Jesus said, go. And they said, we don't want to go. Jesus said, no, get in the boat and go. And they didn't want to go. And Jesus made them get into the boat. John actually tells us that they didn't set off to evening time. They held back and they held back and they waited as long as possible. And then eventually they went. And why did Jesus send them into a storm? Jesus is supposed to be loving and compassionate. 
So why did he send them in this storm? Why did he send them in this storm where they were in absolute turmoil and chaos and fearful for their lives? Well, Jesus sent them into this storm to show them something. And you need to understand that. Jesus knows what's happening in your life. I think there's about 70 people watch online these services not along. Jesus knows what's happening in your life. It's not that he's off guard or off duty or hasn't picked it up on the radar. He knows all about it. He knows all the storms that you face. He knows everything that's happening in your life. He knows all about it. And Jesus allows you to go into that storm. In fact, Jesus would send you into that storm because he wants you to know something about yourself. But he wants you to know something about him. And that's what we're finding here in Matthew chapter 14. What can we say about the disciples? Well, we can say about the disciples that they were pretty self-reliant. I'm going, to, I'm going to make a proposition to you here this morning. You're maybe going to tell me it's an argument from silence. There's no hint of prayer in this passage. Do you hear the disciples praying in this boat? There's no hint of it. You maybe think, well, look, it just doesn't tell us in the text. There's no prayer. There's no calling on God. The disciples are in this storm. And you know what the disciples are full of? Unbelief. They're relying on themselves. They're relying on their own skill. They're not relying on God. I mean, Mark makes this clear for us. Mark makes an unusual connection. Mark tells us this story, and then Mark says, they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. These disciples had been with Jesus. They'd watched the miracles. They'd been part of the 5,000, the feeding of the 5,000, and their hearts were hard. They were full of pride. And the symptom of their pride is their prayerlessness. Let me speak to you and ask you a question. Do you pray? Maybe you say, well, I'm not saved yet. Do you pray? Do you pray? Because if you're not a person of prayer, you're relying on yourself. You're not relying on God. A Christian is somebody that prays. A Christian is somebody that's praying all the time. When you get up in the morning, do you pray? When you go to bed at night, do you get down on your knees and do you pray? I think to myself every night, I get down on my knees and I pray. I think, you know, there's someday this is going to be my last night and then I'm going to meet God. And I want to meet him after praying to him and talking to him. And there's no sign of prayer in this passage. Here we have self-reliant disciples who think they can do it. They're going to plot their own course and they're going to do it. And there's no hint of prayer. I was talking to a friend there just before I left Glasgow and he's telling me about his mum and dad. And they go to the biggest evangelical church in Edinburgh. If I told you the name of the church, it's a very famous church. And he said to me, there's no prayer meeting in our church. And I was shocked, genuinely shocked. He said, there is no prayer meeting in our church. There's one Sunday evening service a month where the focus is on prayer. But there's no weekly prayer meeting. There's no Sunday prayer meeting. The minister hasn't organized a prayer meeting. And it is a fantastic church. I can tell you it's a fantastic church. 600 families, but there's no prayer. And that prayer is a sign of their self-reliance. And here we have disciples, and they're relying on themselves. And they think they can do it. And so Jesus sends them out into this storm. This is God's pattern. God wants to take you where you wouldn't want to go. And God wants to work in you what you can't work in yourself. God wants you to see your weakness. And God wants you to seek his presence. There's a couple of ways that God will get your attention. A Sunday morning is one of the easiest. You'll come to church and you'll listen to a sermon. That's God speaking to you. It's a great privilege to come to church. It's a great privilege to have a Christian in your home. It's a great privilege for a prayer to be made in your home. And that's God speaking to you. But God will get your attention. And then maybe send you into a storm where your boat will be rocking. And he wants you to seek him. And he hasn't forgotten about you. You may be like those 25 children. You grew up in this church and you came to the front and answered the questions from Mr. Finley. Or maybe you're in another church. Maybe you went to GB or BB. And you knew all about God. And now you've grown up a wee bit and you've your own family and you're busy and there's work and, and maybe God's just slipped down the agenda. But in the back of your mind, you think, you know, well, I still believe and I still go to church. But God just doesn't want to leave you there. He's not happy for you just to coast. He'll send you into a storm because he wants you to seek him and rely on him. And that's what we're learning here in Matthew 14. What does Jesus want to show them? Our second question, he wants to show them who he is. As I was saying to the boys and girls, 
It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. We don't come to church to fill our heads full of knowledge. We come to church to fill our hearts full of a love for Jesus. And you only love somebody when you know what they're like. And what's Jesus like? Well, it says in verse 25, and I can just picture it. He came to them walking in the sea. When I got the ferry back there on Friday, I felt like saying to one of the, wee, the crew members, can I go and talk to the captain of this boat and ask him, has he ever seen anybody walking in the sea? You've never seen anybody walking in the sea. Go down to the, go down to the, the, the shore there and try and walk in the water. See how, much you, how well you get on. And Jesus just comes. I wonder, did he go walk on top of the waves or did he just take it to a straight line? Jesus is just walking in the water here. And you can just imagine the chaos of all that you see around. You know, the wind and the waves. And Jesus just comes strolling out. And it's quite amazing here. Jesus comes to his disciples here in the middle of this turmoil. He hasn't forgotten about them. Mark tells us that Jesus is up on a mountain praying and he sees the disciples. Now, I don't think that Jesus had some sort of supernatural vision, like these x-ray eyes, that Jesus could literally see them. I think as Jesus was praying, he had this vision in his heart. He knew what they were doing. I mean, it's the middle of the night. They're six miles away, and there's a storm. There's nobody going to see six miles in the middle of the night in a storm. They're not going to see a boat in the middle of the sea. And so Jesus knows what's happening. He knows these disciples are struggling. He knows they're in fear of their life, but he lets them keep going. And then he comes to them. I want you to notice that. Christian, are you struggling? Maybe you say, where's Jesus? Where's Jesus in all of this? He's walking straight up to you. He came to them walking in the sea. You're supposed to hold your New Testament in one hand and the Old Testament in the other. Who walks in the sea? God walks in the sea. Job 38, 16. Have you entered into the springs or walked in the recesses of the deep? Jesus wants wants to show us his power. He walks in the water. There's many people in the read stories like this. I heard Ricky Gervais talking about Jesus, and he said, you know, the Jesus story would be a lot easier to stomach if all these amazing things didn't supposedly happen. And people find it really difficult. They say to me, look, Andrew, you know, I'm happy for Jesus to exist, but these miracles are just a bit much. I really struggle to believe that Jesus walked in water. I don't struggle with it at all. If Jesus is fully God, of course he can walk in water. You know, what, you know what the most amazing thing I think is to believe that there is no God? I think it's an absolutely incredible belief to have that we come out of nothing, that your life is just an accident, that you're going nowhere and it amounts to nothing. To me, that is incredible. There's a God, and He walked this earth, Jesus, the God-man, and He came walking in the water, and He came out to these men. He knew them, and he loved them, and he went to them. And that's what he wants to say to you this morning. He knows you, and he loves you, and he walks out to you. And he speaks to these disciples. Jesus has a purpose here. Jesus wants these disciples to know him. And so he comes to them. Whenever you come to church, Jesus is speaking to you. Whenever you hear David speaking in this pulpit and preaching, that's not just an old book he's talking about. That's God's book. And that's God speaking to you. And he wants to speak to you. And he wants you to hear him. And you're maybe saying, look, I've heard that one before. I know that one. But that's God speaking to you. When you're driving along in the car and you see the wee scripture text nailed up in the lamppost, do you think it's there by accident? Do you think it's by some chance that you read that? That's God speaking to you. And here in Northern Ireland, and in this part of the world in particular, the privileges that we have, they don't have them in Scotland. I could safely tell you, if this was a church in Glasgow, it would be the biggest church in Glasgow. I was in the, in the Highlands last Sunday, in the Bible Belt of Scotland. The church was full of OAPs, and only 20 of them in the back two rows. Just look at your church. Do you think this all happened by accident? God's doing something. And it's a great privilege. And God sends Jesus here to speak to his disciples. And what does Jesus say? He says, take heart. It's I. Do not be afraid. I'm here in the middle of the storm with you. I'm here in the middle of the storm with you. I haven't forgotten about you. I know exactly what's happening. And then he says these words, it is I. It's almost like, do you recognize me? We're supposed to hear these words with our Old Testament understanding. Whenever God spoke to Moses at the burning bush, how did God identify himself? He said, I am who I am. It is I, ego emi. 
when God spoke to Abraham and to Isaac and Jacob, how did he identify himself? I am who I am. Jesus has taken that mantle upon himself. Jesus is saying, I'm the greater Moses. In the same way that Moses fed the people in the wilderness, I fed the 5,000. In the same way that Moses went up the mountain to pray, I went up the mountain to pray. In the same way that Moses crossed over the sea, well, I've crossed over the sea. Jesus is saying, I'm the greater Moses. I'm the better Moses. Jesus is saying, I'm the God man. Do you recognize me? Because I'm coming to you. Why are the disciples in the storm? Jesus put them there. What does Jesus want the disciples to see? He wants them to see who he is. That he's the God man, the rescuer, the savior. And how are the disciples to respond? Well, how are you to respond? Maybe you're here in church this morning, you're a Christian for many years. How does Jesus want you to respond to Matthew 14? Maybe you're a backslider. Maybe you can relate to the children at the front. And at one time you said you knew God. You prayed and asked God to save you. But that's yet you've drifted off. Maybe you're in the middle of a storm and your life is so full of hardship. And it's just out of control. You cannot control the results. You cannot control what they hear. What does God want to say to you? Maybe you're here this morning and you're just totally disinterested. That's just another sermon. Is the time near up yet? God wants to speak to you. He wants you to respond in three ways. Let me tell you those three ways. He wants you to respond in faith. He wants you to respond in obedience. And he wants you to respond in worship. First of all, the obedience. Do you see it there in verse 28? Peter speaks up, sees Jesus walking across the water. Now remember, in verse 22, Jesus had to compel the disciples. They didn't want to listen. But now in verse 28, Peter speaks up and says, Lord, since it is you, command me. You speak, and I listen. You're the captain, and I'm just one of your officers. This isn't bravado from Peter. This isn't Peter taking it upon himself. He looks to Jesus and says, Jesus, you speak to me, and I listen to you. What is faith? I mean, faith is a thing we talk a lot about, and some people think, oh, I don't have much faith, or I've weak faith, or I lost my faith. Faith is taking Jesus at his word. He speaks, and I listen. He says, trust me. And I do it. He says, ask for forgiveness, and I ask. He says, pray, and I pray. He says, go, and I go. Jesus speaks, and I respond. That's what faith is. And Peter exercises faith here. Faith loves adventure. Christ- Christianity is, is not for those who are, who are boring, who just want to sit on the shelf and wait for things to happen. Christians are adventurous people. Why are we adventurous? Why do we want to try new things? Why, why, why do we want to... You know, take our lives and say, God, these are yours, because we want to risk all in God. We want to say, I trust you. I'm prepared to go where you're going to ask me to go. So Peter steps out of the boat. Maybe you're in a rut. Maybe you're finding it really hard to pray. Maybe you're reading your Bible and you only read a verse and you think, I don't understand that, and then you give up. Maybe you close your eyes to pray and you start thinking about all the things you have to do in the week. Just talk to God. He does hear you. He speaks to you and he says, I want you to talk to me. So just do it. Just grasp it. Take him at his word. He hears you. He loves you. He knows you. He knows all about your sin. He knows all about the mistakes you've made. He knows about all the times you've messed up. He knows what a hypocrite you are. He knows how you've let him down. He knows about all the disappointments. He knows every single bit of that. And yet he still comes to you and he still speaks to you. And he says, I want you to step out of the boat. I want you to get out of that rut. And I want you to trust in me. You've let yourself down and you've let your family down, but you can still trust in me and I'll still use you. I still love you and I'll still come to you. The previous evening, Peter had been with Jesus during the feeding of the 5,000 and he had partaken in that miracle. And here once again, he's ready to participate. And what's Jesus' word? Come. Come. Let me leave one word with you this morning. Just one word. What's Jesus' one word to you? Come. You backslider? Come on. You struggling? Come. You're not saved yet? Come. That's Jesus' word. That's what he says to Peter here. Come. And so Peter steps out of the boat. But the faith that got Peter out of the boat should have been the faith that kept Peter walking to Jesus. Why do ministers fall away? Why do ministers give up in the gospel? Why do elders give up in the gospel? 
Why do Sunday school teachers give up on the gospel? Why do GB leaders give up on the gospel? Why do people who profess to know Jesus for 30 years turn their back on Jesus and walk away? Why do they do that? I'll give you the answer. It's the answer of Matthew 14. They take their eyes off Jesus. Last Saturday, I climbed Ben Nevis. It's a long walk. Not as beautiful as the Moorns, I can tell you, but it's a long walk. And I have to admit, I was a bit of a greenhorn going up that mountain. The first man I met in the mountain, he said to me, he took a look at me and he looked me up and down. He said, do you know what you're doing when you get to the top? I said, I haven't a clue. He said, whenever you get to the top, there are these cairns. I said, what's a cairn? Is that the top of the mountain? He just looked at me. He goes, no, a cairn's a pile of rocks. He says, whenever you get to the top, do not lose sight of those cairns. Whenever you get to the top, there's a cliff on one side and there's a cliff on the other side. And if you lose sight of those cairns, you'll go off the side. So just you make sure you keep your eyes on them and your focus on them and don't lose sight of those piles of rocks all the way to the summit. And that's the Christian life. You keep your eye on Jesus. You do not lose sight in Jesus. Why do ministers fall away? They take their eyes off Jesus. Why do elders fall away? They take their eyes off Jesus. They get caught up in a sin. Then they get caught up in their own strength. But are your eyes supposed to be in Jesus? What happened, Peter, here? He saw the wind and he saw the waves and he took his eyes off Jesus. And he started to sink. And that's what happens in the Christian life. You always sink when you take your eyes off Jesus. And Peter cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus, who is so gracious, Jesus, who is so wonderful and so loving and so compassionate to those who have strong faith and to those who have weak faith, Jesus just reaches out his arm and he pulls them up. They come into the boat and then what do they do? They worship. This morning, as you meet here in Analong in our fisherman service, I can tell you, you're as close to God as you want to be. You're not further away than you want to be and you're not near than you want to be. You're exactly the place that you want to be. But Jesus wants more. He wants you to be close to Him. He wants your focus to be in Him. He doesn't even want your focus to be in the turmoil or the chaos or the storm that's happening all around you. He wants your focus to be in Him because He is a Savior who's come to rescue you, who's come to rule you, and who's come to use you. Do you know this Savior? Let's bow our heads and let's talk to Him now. Father in heaven, we thank you for bringing us to this church service this morning, and it's a great blessing and encouragement for us. Father, we thank you for your word that speaks to us, not just an old book, but it's your book to each one of us, like an arrow going straight to the middle of the target. And Father, I pray that you would speak to someone this morning who's not yet saved, and they would come right through to you. They would hear that word, come, and they would come. Father, I pray for those who are in the middle of the storm that they would know your nearness and your presence and that they would see your power. Not that you would take them out of the storm, but that you'd be with them in the middle of it. Father, we ask that you would so work in our hearts that we run to Jesus in faith and in obedience and in worship. And in his name we pray. Amen. Just for a hand back to David, we're going to stand and sing again, Love Lifted Me.
taking us through God's word this morning. And Andrew will be at the door, and I'm sure there'll be a, a lot of folks wanting to, to have a word with him, so he'll be there. But if you do want to speak to him about anything that he shared this morning, then he'll be there, and I'll be there also, uh, if you are thinking of these things of salvation. Uh, let me take you quickly through some announcements for the week ahead. Uh, evening worship is this evening at 7 o'clock, and our guest speaker continuing in the fisherman services will be the Reverend Owen Patterson, who's minister there in Downpatrick and Ard Glass, uh, but uh, Owen uh, knows a little bit about the harbour down there and its people. And so do come and hear Owen uh, share from God's word this evening. It's still uh, not too late to give an invitation. So there are some invitation cards out in the vestibule. If you do want to lift one uh, and bring it to someone this afternoon to invite to come along, well, do do that. And uh, that service is at 7 o'clock and then there'll be a, a cup of tea or coffee uh, as we normally do served after that service. Youth Fellowship meets this evening at a quarter past eight in the Net Hall, and all young people of secondary school age are welcome to that. Then warm welcome from 10 o'clock to 12 noon tomorrow morning in the Fellowship Room, and that's a warm space with refreshments for anyone of any age, and there'll be folks there to serve you uh, if you come along to that. Whether you come along for 10 minutes or for the two hours, you're very welcome. Then our uniformed organisations, BB and GB, meet as they normally do in the incoming week. Then on Tuesday afternoon at half past two, the Tuesday Fellowship will meet for our senior citizens and the guest speaker will be the Reverend Robin Quinn. Robin's no stranger to us, so do come along uh, on Tuesday afternoon at half past two to hear Robin. Then the bowling club meets at half seven uh, on Tuesday evening. Then on Wednesday, Tots and Toys, a parent and toddler group at 10 o'clock in the church hall. Midweek continues at 8 o'clock in the fellowship room and we're continuing our new series looking at the tabernacle and everyone is welcome and tea and coffee will be served on arrival. Then on Thursday evening, women together meet at 8 o'clock in the fellowship room and Sarah and Anna Hill will be speaking on God's love and all uh, ladies of our congregation are welcome to attend that. Then I got a, an announcement given to me last night at Morn District uh, Orange Choir are holding a gospel concert on Saturday evening the 11th of February in Kilkeel Orange Hall at a quarter to eight. Those taking part include the Morn District Orange Choir, the Cafe 180 Band and Grace Alone from Kilhorn Parish Church. There will be a retiring offering in aid of the Newry Hospice and the Drew Nelson Fund. So all, uh, everyone is welcome to that um, on Saturday the 11th of February at a quarter to eight. Next Sunday, um, I'll be fulfilling a, a, a preaching obligation that I have from before COVID. Uh, I'm speaking at a PW service over in Newry and Downshire Road and Ryan's. So I'll not be here, but I'm doing a pulpit swap with the Reverend uh, Brian Colvin, who is the minister there in Downshire Road and Ryan's. So Brian will be here and I'll be in Newry, but I'll be back for the evening service uh, next Sunday. So if uh, you're child is one of those that Andrew has encouraged to bring a friend. It's not going to be a hassle for me. Um, <laughs> wouldn't that be a lovely surprise for Brian? <laughs> and simply, as I finish the announcements, I do want to say a word of thanks. Um, you, for many of you, have simply turned up here this morning, but others uh, in the past month and in the past week have been putting a lot together uh, to, to put into this service. So I do want to thank Gary and those who decorated the meeting house for us. Thank you, Gary, and your team who helped you with that. And uh, also I want to thank Wilma, the choir and the music group for how they've prepared uh, for the services as well. Thank you each and every one for your part today. Well, I do want to take a few moments to pray. Uh, and on a day like this, we try and spread the prayers for others uh, across our two services. And so this evening we will be praying for those services uh, that support the fishing industry. Uh, but we're going to be praying this morning for the fishermen's mission and also in general for the industry itself. So let's come and let's join together in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father God, we do thank you that as we sit here this morning, as we've heard your word, as we've heard illustrations from the fishing world that, that help us understand your word, we do thank you that ministry to seafarers continues. And so we thank you for the fishermen's mission. We thank you that here in uh, this part of the world, we get to see it firsthand. We thank you for the work of the mission that it does not just here, but around Northern Ireland. We thank you for the response uh, that both Leslie and Ingrid provide to each need that comes along. And we do pray for them. And we pray for the base in Kilkeel that as they provide much needed facilities to active fishermen and to retired fishermen, so they will continue to share the love of Christ. We thank you that they are with us this morning. And we ask that you will continue to bless them in the work and the ministry that they undertake. Thank you for that warm welcome. 
Thank you for that open door. Thank you for the listening ear. Thank you for the kettle that's always on the boil. Thank you that they're both ready and willing at any point to go out day or night to serve you and to support fishermen who need uh, that support. We thank you for the team of volunteers that they have, uh, many of whom are known to us in this part of the world, but right across in every harbour uh, where they will minister. Thank you for each and every one who support them and assist them in the work that they do. So may you bless them for their faithfulness in ministry in these days and in the days ahead. And we do pray for the fishing industry. We give thanks for it here locally, that as we go into Kilkeel and drive along this shoreline, into the harbour here in Annalong and right up through uh, the Mourns. Thank you, Father, that we get to see it firsthand. And we continue to pray for safety in the harbours and on the seas. And we pray for families at home who watch loved ones go out to sea and eagerly await their return. We pray that you will be the God of all comfort to each and every one who's involved in this uh, line of work. We pray for the fishing fleet as it navigates the waters. May they know a bountiful harvest from the sea, not by the work of their own hands, but as we affirmed at the start of our service, that it is you who put this creation in its order. And we thank you that you bless us so bountifully. And we pray for the future generation of fishermen as they adapt to new ways of fishing these waters. We pray that you will guide them and that you will be with them, that they will know you ever present and that they will look to you as their great captain, who will lead them in the ways that they are to go. We recognize that, as Andrew's already shared, there's so much change and turmoil in the world. And we see that, each and every one of us, in our day-to-day -day places of work. And so, Father, we pray for fishermen as they adapt to the change, as they look at modernization, as they look at how technology helps. We pray that you will guide them and lead them so that, indeed, the fishing community will continue for years to come here in this part of the world. So, Father, hear these our prayers. And as we come to pray for others later this evening, we ask all of these in and through the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we're going to finish this morning by singing a song that we as a congregation uh, started learning uh, last week, but it has been known to us uh, from our services last year. It's called Almost Home, so we'll stand and sing together.
together. Do come back if you can at 7 o'clock this evening when we'll have Owen Patterson with us. Uh, for those of us who gather here regularly, we have our monthly mission prayer guide available this morning in your pew. So do take one of those home with you uh, to guide you in prayer uh, for the month ahead. But as we go our separate ways into the rest of this day, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forevermore. Amen.